and we are recording. Uh, hi everyone, it's uh, actually not 2.30 p.m. I'm not here at least, it's actually in the evening here because I have a guest from far away, a different time zone. So this is actually being recorded, but you're approaching this at 2.30 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon, live from, still from Stockholm, me though. Uh, Donnie here with my Wednesday show, Innovation Fika, Innovation Coffee Break, live every Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Swedish, where I get to interview awesome people about incredible ideas, uh, interesting things happening, and also some kind of key learnings at the end as well. So there's always a good reason to watch this because you always learn something. Today I have a guest, as I said, from far, far away from Seattle, USA. Uh, so we're in a nine hour time zone difference. So actually for the 2.30 p.m. Swedish is actually 5.30 a.m. Uh, for uh, Ingrid, Ingrid Johnson, my guest with this very, very Swedish name as well, uh, which I've heard she actually has some Swedish heritage. So that's kind of cool. She actually sounds more Swedish than I do uh, when it comes to the name. But Yes. Also, I have to say that everything that I record uh, on these shows are uh, saved on YouTube, so you can check out my YouTube channel, and all of my written content is on my Medium channel, uh, Donia Siliganis, with the uh, 500 plus posts there. Um, this is actually episode 99 of my Innovation Fika, so almost 100 episodes. Uh, super cool. Uh, consistency, right? That's what they say. Anyway, enough about me, enough about that. Let's introduce our guest of the day. Ingrid Johnson, straight from Seattle, USA. How wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for so much for having me and thank you for changing the recording time. I have an eight year old and if I got up at five in the morning to record anything, <laughs> it would have been a complete meltdown in the house. So I really appreciate you doing this. No worries at all, no worries at all. Just happy to be able to have you on the show. And as I always do, I always start by asking my guests, who are you Ingrid and what do you do? Hi, I'm Ingrid. I'm a senior technical recruiter in Seattle. I am from the city of Seattle, so I grew up here. And when I was born, way back in the, as the kids say, 1900s, <laughs> 1980s, um, there was no Microsoft and there was no Amazon. So I've had a front row seat watching this tech industry explode in my backyard. And what people don't understand about Seattle is that it's very small. We only have about 700,000 people in the proper Seattle proper because it's landlocked. So we have bodies of waters on both sides and we have very strict housing restrictions. You know, it's a tiny city. And at the biggest point with Amazon corporate, they had about 60,000 people working in corporate in downtown Seattle. So it was almost one out of 10 of every man, woman and child <laughs> in the city. Wow. In addition, Microsoft is here, and then every other company you can possibly think of moved here to try to poach from Amazon and Microsoft. Of so course. when I got, into, I got into tech on accident because um, I just you know couldn't walk down the street without running into 15 software engineers, and I got interested in what they were doing, and I started asking a lot of questions, and that helped me fall into the career that I have now, which is working with these really talented and special people who are building our future and helping them find jobs that they like and are fulfilling to them. Yeah, awesome. And you actually have a show as well, uh, a podcast or a show or a series of videos called What the Tech? Yeah, so um, after the last six months or so, especially in Seattle and San Francisco, we've had some changes that are um, head whipping. I'd say whiplash um, in tech. So. The money has moved really quickly out of tech. We're experiencing our first wave of massive layoffs in the tech sector in at least 10 years. And people are really confused as to what's going on. I am also confused, <laughs> but yeah. since I was at Twitter and I'm no longer working there, I had time to do some research. And the research that I did is aimed at helping job seekers figure out what's going on in the economy and understanding the fundamental changes that are happening right under their feet and kind of take a deep breath and realize that it's okay. Yeah, but, and that's, I think that's a very, very, very important message, you know, take a deep breath, it's gonna be okay. Because I know that, okay, so I'm, I'm older than you are, but we've both seen a couple of recessions. I mean, it's not, this isn't the first time we've seen things happening, right? Uh, but for many people in their like, the 20s and early 30s. This is the first really big 
recession that they might be seeing as well. So there must be a, a huge shock. Uh, and this also, also directly after the pandemic, which was a big shift in itself. Uh, so, I mean, there's been like a oh, mayhem going on here for a couple of years now. Yeah, and the most confusing part about this particular recession is that there was not a precipitating event that caused this recession. So when we had the pandemic, it was obvious what caused the recession. It's a global yeah. pandemic. No one can go to work. Um, same with other housing, like the financial crisis in 2008. You knew people that were losing their homes. It was your dad, your mom, your cousin, you maybe. And for this one, there isn't anything you can look at and point to and say, yes, that is the problem. Instead, it's like a shift, like a crumbling away of jobs. And it's more confusing because, for example, today, data came out from the United States labor market that said, our market is too strong. Things are too good in our job market. And as a result, the stock market crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, that's, that so confusing. But you've you've seen you you I mean you are seeing and you have seen a lot of things from the inside that most of us are only reading about. Do you do you and, and of course I have so many questions about this and I uh, uh, we'll probably have a thousand questions as well when people are watching this live that they will pass on to you as well and, and you can catch catch up with. Tell you what, uh, when you're watching this live, dear viewer. Make sure to post your questions in the feed anyway, and then Ingrid can catch up with the questions as she gets online, uh, you know, a couple of hours later. But one question I had was, did you get a feeling that the a big part of the layoffs is because, oh, they're doing it, so we can do it as well? Kind of absolutely. thing? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I believe when Elon took Twitter over, there was a new transparency in tech, especially around profitability. Because before there were quarterly reports, earnings reports, there were analyst calls. And to really understand that you had to dig and you have to know a certain vernacular and understand like, okay, what does that mean? What's an active daily user? What does this mean when it's, you know, price and then, you know, how much profit we made versus how much we spent. And Elon came out and said, we're losing $4 million a day <laughs> on, yeah. on Twitter. And that was tangible. So the everyday person accessed that and was like, huh? How can this company, who people think are these amazing, smart, special people, be losing $4 million a day? And the reality is that most tech isn't profitable on a day-to-day -day basis. They're really not. So when Elon came out and said that, it did open the garage door. It's not a floodgate. It's not a slide. It was like the whole garage for other companies to say, yeah, that's true. We're really not doing that well either. And we hired all these people because of one reason and one reason only, which is we wanted them to think of the next great money-making tech product yeah. and to innovate. And since they didn't really do that in a timely fashion, we have to fire one third of them. Yeah. We absolutely. Yeah, and also, I mean, we uh, were a couple of Swedish companies uh, like Spotify and Klarna and others. I mean, they took on a lot of people during the pandemic as well, uh, and they, you know, just swelled up a bit too fast as well. And and now we're seeing the, the you know the 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 uh, like the the counter surge of that. And then I, I and again, I get the feeling that they are, and this is my personal opinion that you know they're they're you know they're they're taking the opportunity to maybe cut off a bit more than they, they might need just to sort of make sure that, okay, well, let's, let's clean up, let's clean up house now and make sure that everything is, so I, I get that. Um, but also, but what else are you sort of seeing from where you, where you are? Because I mean, you're standing sort of in the epicenter of so much of the big tech. Uh, any other sort of big things happening and the big other big signs that we can sort of yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you and I had connected because I had a comment about personal data, which over the yeah. past 10 years or so, personal data was more valuable than oil as a commodity, which is silly because it's not really a thing. It's who you are, what you like, what you click on, what you don't click on, what you'd say into your smart speaker, all that stuff. And what started happening over the last couple of years, especially with people being at home, was kind of an ick factor about personal data collection. So in addition to America being very, very far behind the EU on data laws, um, we are now 
starting to implement them slowly mm -hmm. state by state. So in California, for example, there's new data laws against harvesting da data from children, which was not illegal in the United States. So, and still isn't in lots of areas. And that's shocking to people from other countries because you're like, what? <laughs> Wait a second, <laughs> you can't do that. And then we also have a new regulator, a new top cop at the SEC. And that's the Securities and Exchange Commission for my international viewers. And they, these people police Wall Street. And the way that they police Wall Street is they find people who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing and they sue them for big fines. Mm -hmm. And our new SEC chair, his name is Gary Gensler, he has gone after big tech more than anyone else in the past. And it's been about data privacy breaches. So you'll see companies, not only Twitter, um, Facebook, there was a hearing where a product manager came and spoke in front of the legislature a couple years back. Um, recently, Epic, the maker of Fortnite games, had a big fine for harvesting yeah. the data of children. And now there is finally that wrist slapping for these companies that are realizing this isn't sustainable. The amount of data that we're collecting now is going to be the apex. And then it's going to go away because yeah. it's being legislated away because people are noticing it now and going, yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that yeah. my Roomba is measuring the size of my house. Why yeah. is it doing that? And my yeah. favorite product that truly was the pinnacle of text misunderstanding of people and their personal data is a product called Amazon Halo. So this came out a few years back and it was a wearable like Fitbit and you wear it on your wrist and it's um, it doesn't have a display screen. It's just very low profile. And the people who made it are brilliant and it's a trackable. So it tracks your, your physical exercise, your heart rate, how much you sleep. But where it got weird was that Amazon advertised and asked users to scan in pictures of themselves naked to Amazon <laughs> for purposes of measuring body fat percentage. Uh -huh. You and I think that's weird. Everyone else watching that thinks that's weird. Amazon, for some reason, no one told them that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. It debuted for $200 and now I see them online selling for $24.99. They can't what, get rid of them. What were they supposed to be doing though? I mean, what were they what was the actual sort of idea? What what was their great idea with Halo? Um, well, I wasn't in the room, but I do think that when you have a group of people who are all the same, say for example, all software engineers who love this stuff and think it's helpful. And they honestly are good people who have high ethics. Yeah. Software engineers are some of the most ethical people I've ever met in my life. They wanna make things that help people and not hurt people. They thought it would be great if you didn't have to go to the doctor to get your body fat percentage, if you just knew, and then you could measure it just like we measure anything else. Because to them, it's just data. Yeah, they exactly. didn't think about how gross that would feel <clears throat> for you to send that off to someone that you don't even know who it is because yeah. they're, not, they're not nefarious. They just thought it would be helpful. Yeah, but, that, that, but that's the thing as well. You know, when I know we, we could have a separate conversation on this topic only, you know, when, when there's nobody in the room that actually puts their hand up and say, hey, guys and girls, isn't this like going like the wrong way? I mean, the, the, the whole because if you only look at it like, you know, it's only data, then you can always see how we can do. I mean, it would be fantastic if all data was accessible to everyone all the time. And if, of course, then nobody wanted to do anything bad with that data at all. Yeah, right? and, yeah. I think that this was actually, this is a more harmless use of our data, but it yeah. was a more of a visceral feeling of you want yeah. what? <laughs> no, yeah. you know, yeah. so but, there is, there are other ways that our data is being used that I personally find more harmful than taking a picture, a nude, and sending it to Amazon. Yeah. But this was kind of the jump the shark moment that I saw yeah. in personal data gathering. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's not going to work. And then... But but this that's a big... But what you're saying is that this is a big change coming now in big tech when it comes to the whole personal data harvesting thing, which yes. is going to change the coming two or three years or so with, the, with legislation actually being in, put in place and enforced now. Yeah, and we see that right now. I mean, you don't have to look down the road 
to see the freaking out that's happening by the yeah. big companies because of the new AI chatbots. Okay. Yeah. If you are not worried about the future of your company, you don't buy a company and then launch a beta of that product in two weeks and give it to everyone without testing it. But what I see when I look at big tech companies is that they are very concerned about the future of their company and about innovation. And they're kind of rolling the dice on these untested, yeah. odd, a little bit creepy services. Yeah. Um, and for me, that feels strange because I've seen people being generally risk averse when it comes out to rolling new products. And now yeah. it just feels like there's a bunch of teenage boys throwing things at and seeing what sticks. You know, it's really, really an odd time. I know, I, I, but that's the impression I got as well, that somebody let a cat out of the bag a bit too early and then everybody's throwing cats out to go, yeah. here's ours. Here's ours. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're panicking that you know, if, if Microsoft has a chat bot, then no one will ever use Google's, which isn't true because AWS came out first as the first cloud service. People used it. Then Microsoft yeah. had one and then Google had one. People used both of those. It yeah. didn't matter who was first in that market yeah. space. But today it does feel like panic. It feels yeah. very panicky. Um, well, which, is, which is very strange because that's exactly what you said. That, that I mean, we've said for... In, in the whole startup world, for 20 years, we've said, you know, it's, yes, there is a first mover advantage, but, you know, Apple didn't invent the smartphone and Google didn't invent search and, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you, it's about being the best and, you know, offering the best service. But suddenly now everybody's running like mad and panicking and just throwing things out there to see what sticks, as you say. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's one very interesting phenomenon, let's call it that. And I know that Twitter is, it's, I mean, with, with Elon's, kind of what you said, you know, hey, we're losing four million a day. We need to, and then just kind of in a, in a very sort of unlarge company way, just going, yeah. <laughs> you know, just changing things like overnight, which is, was, a, I think, a big shock for many as well. But I had another question as well, because I, uh, I spent a year in Silicon Valley, which was then uh, still, you know, the, the crown jewel and everything it was 2015. I mean, so many years ago, it's like, wow, right? Uh, but, and, I've, and then you read about during the pandemic, there was this uh, exodus from Silicon Valley and from San, uh, San Francisco leaving uh, up into Seattle and to other places. And, and do you still see that happening or what, anything like that going on? Or what do you see happening when it comes to the, where people like sort of congregate around tech today? Well, I think that this has been a major shock for cities. So when Amazon was in Seattle, Seattle was in charge. The city of Seattle had leverage over Amazon because they were in Seattle and the city of Seattle demanded a whole lot from them as far as paying per head taxes for people who make over a certain amount of money. Um, and they really could negotiate with Amazon to an extent where Amazon kind of had to bow down to what the city wanted for certain things. When the pandemic happened and people moved away, the city realized that they do not have that leverage over the big companies anymore. And so big companies are doing a couple things. One, they are canceling leases in big cities for millions and millions of dollars. Google's canceled, I think I read, $50 million in office space leases and just writing it off um, as a wash. And same with Amazon. Amazon's recently announced that they're not going to continue to build HQ2 in so, DC because they don't think that the investment is going to be a good investment for them. But before the pandemic, you could never have told people that, right? It was people were jumping up and down to get Amazon to come to their city. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, the cities have become so expensive that normal people can't live here. And I'm a normal person. I happen to be divorced and have a child and I do not have a great gorgeous house. It's a small house. It's almost a hundred years old. It costs me $3,000 a month in rent just to live close to this city. So if yeah. I had a choice, I would leave too. I would go somewhere where I had more space. I would go somewhere that was more affordable and I would take advantage of the remote jobs that are still listed. Yeah. And I can't because I have a kid here with someone, but people were just doing the thing that made the most sense, which is improving their lives and not really worrying about that commute anymore. Unfortunately for them, 
that is new leverage for companies to have mass layoffs in another name, which no, means go back to the office or you're gone. Yeah. What are you going to exactly. do if you live in Idaho and it's a, it's a 12 hour drive yeah. to Amazon? You're going to be laid off in another name, right? Yeah. Oh, that's also, I mean, that's so interesting because I, I remember seeing, I remember walking, I mean, I, I used to work in Palo Alto. Uh, I couldn't live there because it was too expensive. So I actually, li I actually lived in San Francisco because it was a lot cheaper, which is also crazy because it was crazy expensive. But compared to Palo Alto, which was, I think, was the second most expensive place to live in the U.S. when I was there. And yeah. you were walking, you know, you're walking down the street. And and I, 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 used, I usually tell people that every other like restaurant had a sign saying help wanted, help mm -hmm. wanted, help wanted, because nobody that were in was in the service business could afford to live in Palo Alto and, and it became more and more expensive. So the commute to actually commute into Palo Alto became too long. So nobody in, you know, service, healthcare, uh, anything like, uh, what's it called? Uh, fire uh, fighters, anything yeah. like all of that sort of just yeah. disappeared yeah. because nobody sure. could afford, yeah, nobody in a service, job with a normal salary could afford to live in that very expensive city, which is yes. a, a, another sort of phenomenon when it comes to ex expensive cities. Uh, we have that same problem in Seattle today. There are 100 yeah. jobs open for grocery stores and people who make over $100,000 are out of work. But yeah. we can't take those jobs because then you can't afford your life. So yeah. it's, a, it's a labor mismatch and it's going to continue in this way until yeah. those jobs are filled. Um, yeah. So what's going to happen is I had the good fortune of being a stockbroker in 2008. That was my first job out of school. I didn't know what I was doing and I had no business handling anyone's money. But I was working at Merrill Lynch when the financial crash happened. And being in my early 20s, I had to take a job that was a 50% pay cut. And I had to move. Um, and unfortunately, that will happen in tech to newer employees. They just yeah. don't know it yet. Yeah, exactly. So you were actually at Merrill Lynch in 2008. So that's, that's really another inside, you know, another recession from the inside, really. Yeah. There. No as one well. should do what I did in my career. Don't, if I get a job <laughs> in a new industry, don't go to it. <laughs> well, I can tell I, you, I, I, yeah, well, I, I was on, I was on the receiving end of the 2008 crash as well, because I had a huge startup. We were just, you know, uh, VC funded. We were. I mean, we even had the paperwork on the table to oh. say to sign a Series A with ten million dollars. We were just about to go, 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 and I had all of these. And I mean, all of the crazy startup stories. I had a board screaming at me, employ more people, employ more people, and I'm going with which money? I don't have any money yet. And I said, Oh, don't worry, the money's coming, the money's coming. Employ more people, and then I mean, from one day to another, the phone stopped ringing. I mean, seriously, from what, and I was like, sort of, okay. And then 10 days after that, I had to call all of the, we were like 40 plus staff then, everybody into the conference room and said, look, uh, you five here, you've still got a job. The rest yes. of us, we're fired. I know. <laughs> Just woof, like that. It was like, God, slaughter. Yeah. Uh, so I was that was a tough one. Uh, that was a, a tough one. So I I we I was in that one as well. Definitely. It's so the, hard. You know, when you I I feel like college and school don't do people a favor when it comes to the job market because when you're in college and you're in school, you know whether you're passing or failing. You know whether that you aced the test or you failed it. You exactly. know when you're going to graduate. You know what's yeah. expected of you. You know all the milestones. So it's a black and yeah. white world being in school. And then yeah. when you get into your job it's gray all the time. So yeah. nobody knows. And, what's gonna I, and things happen that aren't in your control and it's not your fault. It's just sort of, it just happens to you and you have to take it in stride and realize it's not your fault. It's just, it, you know, it happens. Uh, and, you, yeah. and with that, with that, actually, this is a perfect transition into the ending. Oh, this is the world's fastest half an hour. I always say that on this show. It's the world's <laughs> fastest 30 minutes. But I will say that we always end with our, our guests giving us, you know, their top three tips. And we're actually speaking to a seasoned tech recruiter here. And we're going to see if we can, what Ingrid has to say about uh, the whole sort of, especially the job search situation now, because we don't learn it in school, but kids, you're going to learn it here.
right? So Ingrid's top three tips. Um, and we're starting off with tip number one being broaden your search. Yes. So in tech, I used to say we played musical chairs between the tech companies from people getting their careers and moving on and getting a raise from Google to Microsoft to Amazon to Meta and on and on and on. And what do you do when none of those companies are hiring? Well, you have to look where the money is. And there is money. There's a ton of money, which is great news. Like I said, today, we got a report that said the economy is so strong. Oh, no. Um, here in the States, the money is going into manufacturing. It's going into green energy. It's going into defense. It's going into healthcare. All of those companies that you might not have ever heard of before need people with tech skills. They still have computers. They still have data to store. They still need digital marketing. They need everybody with tech skills and they don't even know how to find you. So you can find them. And there's a couple different ways that you can do that. You can look up who's getting government contracts and there's lists of companies who has gotten billions and billions of dollars and go look at their job boards. Um, you can just read the newspaper. You can look and see who's doing you know, bidding on big projects. So you need to broaden your search and throw away the top 10 tech companies that you always dreamed of working at. You can work there later, but you can't work there in the next couple of years. Go yeah. where you're needed. Yeah, and we had exactly the same situation in Sweden when it comes to, we have an enormous surge when it comes to green energy and in new, when whole new industries are starting and they don't have anyone. Nope. And they need they need everyone. So, you know, it's uh, definitely very good. Uh, tip number two is, and I love this one, party like it's 1999. And for us over a certain age, we know the where that expression comes from, but please explain. Okay, so the artist formerly known as Prince had a hit song, Party Like It's 1999. And this is what I'm telling people as far as their job search goes. So we need to remove the last 10, 15 years of job search where you had a LinkedIn profile and then you waited and people came up to you or you just pushed the button and pushed your application through on a computer system. There's so many people who are unemployed. You can't do that and expect anything to happen. When I was a kid, in 1999, I was 16, I had to print out my physical resume and drop it off at the places that were hiring, go in and shake the hand and say, I want to talk to Mr. Manager, or Mrs. Manager, and give them a piece of paper. So when I tell people about their job search today, they really need to take that old school approach, be scrappy, but be persistent. If you apply to a job, call them, follow up with them, email them, apply once a week. You must be super scrappy and think of it like, walking around down the street and passing your resume out and introducing yourself. Because if you apply to something that has 200 applicants within the first half hour, guaranteed 199 of them are not gonna follow up. So yeah. be the one person that does. Yeah, uh, and 100%, and I can I can just nod and say, oh my God, that is so true. I, I, I got a beautiful flat in San Francisco that I, that I had a, they subletted me for the year I was there. And everybody was like, oh, you're so lucky. You just got a flat just off the train station. And you're, you know, I was like, okay, well, should we talk about the four days I spent actually walking every single street, knocking on every single door, speaking to every single landlord for four full days until I actually got one to say, you know what? Might have a flat for you, guy. I think mean, that's, it's, Ugh. That's why so, they yeah. call it job search. It's a search. You have, you have to treat it like a full time job. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, very good. Uh, and tip number three as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So a bottle of wine and a trashy TV show are just as good for you right now as stressing out about your job. Everyone who is my age has been through this multiple times we are still stressed out. We still have bills. We still have obligations, but we know that we're going to walk through it a day at a time. You are too. No matter where you are in your career, what happens to you over the next couple of years will be over and you'll be at the end of it. So take some deep breaths. Let yourself have an emotional break from all the pressure that you've been putting on yourself to succeed and have a certain title, make a certain amount of money, and just take things as they come. And it's going to be okay. You're going to do it. You're doing it already. But this isn't about any individual person. It's not in your control. 
So relax. Yeah. Wonderful. What a so, so good. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Uh, really, really good tips. And thanks for a great conversation as well. I mean, we could probably go on for another couple of hours. We will definitely come back to this conversation again. We can talk about lots of other uh, eerie, weird tech as well. And another show, I will definitely follow your series of What the Tech. And I will encourage everyone to interact with Ingrid, follow her and connect with her on LinkedIn and, and interact. Make sure to post your questions in the feed here in for this show and Ingrid will, will catch up with them uh, as she gets, when her time zone catches up with our time zone again after this actual broadcast. But with that, Ingrid, I will say thank you so very much for joining me on the show today. I'm super happy that you, that you made it today. And um, with that, I want to thank everybody watching and say thank you for this time and i'll see you next week 2 30 p.m cet innovation fika with noni and with another guest but for now we're saying thank you and goodbye to ingrid thank you everyone <laughs>